Mostly true, but it will, some permutation groups will actually appear towards the end. Uh, in any case, I will discuss the motivations for this talk shortly, but I'd like to begin by jumping right in and finding the main object of studying this talk, that is the intersection graph delta G of a given group G. This graph has vertices the proper non trivial subgroups of G, so the two vertices joined by an edge if and only if their intersection is non trivial. This graph was introduced in 1969 by Chapman and Puck, as an analog of the intersection graph of a semi which was introduced by Bosak several years earlier. So as two straightforward examples, here is, first of all, the intersection graph of the alternating group of degree 4 and the graph of the dihedral group of order h. On the right, I've labeled the subgroups by their orders and conjugacy classes, and on the left, just by their orders, because two subgroups of given order in A4 are already conjugate. Now, why are we interested in studying such a graph? Well, given a binary relation defined on the subgroups for elements of a group, like this non-trivial intersection relation, we can encode that relation using a graph. And by studying that graph and the properties, or the, the relationship between its properties and the underlying group, we can obtain new and interesting methods of understanding groups and distinguishing between individual groups and families of groups, like the recognizability that Melissa spoke about. So what kinds of properties can we consider here? Well, in this talk, I'll focus on connectedness and diameter. So for example, between these two graphs, it's clear that only the one on the right is connected. That is, there is a path along any pair of vertices in the graph or rather a path uh, along edges in the graph between any pair of vertices. We can also easily see that the graph on the right has diameter 3. That is, 3 is the maximal distance between any pair of vertices. For an example of a pair of vertices witnessing diameter 3, take any one labeled 2a and any one labeled 2c, starting from 2a, we can go to 4a, then 4b, then 2c, giving a path of length 3, and there's no shorter path between these vertices. All right, now, Chuck and Pollock proved a nice result related to what I was just talking about in the case where G is a non-trivial, non-simple finite group. They, they proved, first of all, that the graph is not connected if and only if G is either the direct product of two groups of prime order, or G is trivial sensor and every proper subgroup is abelian. And the second case is exactly what occurs for A4. On the other hand, they proved that if the graph is connected, then its diameter is always at most 4. So I'd like to make some comments about this theorem, and to make some uh, extra room on the slide, I'll hide these figures. So first of all, the groups of the second type in the first part of the theorem were classified almost 120 years ago by Miller and Moreno. In fact, they classified all finite non-abelian groups where every proper subgroup is abelian. Secondly, we just saw that D8 has a graph of diameter 3, but it's not actually known if there exists a finite non-simple group where the graph has diameter exactly equal to the graph of diameter 4. What is known is that if such a group does exist, then it is the semi-direct product of a non-abelian simple group and the cyclic group of odd prime order. This was essentially noted by Chakanya and Pollock, although they did specify that the prime has to be odd, but this is quite easy to deduce. OK, so now let's focus on the complementary case, that is where G is still finite, but now non-abelian and simple. So what is known in this case? Well, first of all, in 2010, Shen proved that the graph here is always connected, and he asked two questions. First, does the graph's diameter have an upper bound? And if it does, then does the upper bound of 4 from the non-simple case apply here as well? Before addressing these questions, I'll take us a bit out of order chronolo chronologically to state that in 2017, Charles Safari and Chris Rabi proved that 3 is a lower bound for the graph's diameter. And at this point, this was known to be a tight lower bound. For example, A5 achieves a graph of diameter 3. So what about the upper bound? Well, in the same year Shen's paper, but independently from Shen, Herzog, Longobardi, and Mai investigated the subgraph of delta G induced by the maximal subgroups of G. So this graph is vertices the proper, or just the maximal subgroups of G, where again, edges corresponding, correspond to subgroups that intersect non-trivially. And their work implies immediately that the graph's diameter is at most 64. So there is indeed an upper bound, giving an affirmative answer to Shen's first question. And in 2016, Mara reduced this upper bound from 64 to 28. This was not proved to be a tight upper bound, and so at this stage, Shen's second question remained open. And I'd like to note that there's a, a nice connection between this talk and Melissa's. Uh, the proofs of Shen, Herzog, Adal, and Ma all involve relationships between <coughs> delta G and the prime graph, where again the prime graph is vertices, the prime divisors of the order of G, and two primes in the graph are joined by an edge. That's what that, that tilde symbol means, if and only if G has an element whose order is the product of those primes. 
Okay, so now let's actually answer Shen's second question. So last year I proved that given a non-abelian finite simple group G, the diameter of the intersection graph is always at most five. And in fact, this is a tight upper bound. For example, the sporadic baby monster group has a graph of diameter five. So this means that Shen's second question has an answer of no. The upper bound of four from the non-simple case does not apply here, but five applies instead. And finally, if the graph has diameter five and G is not the baby monster, then G is a, uni a unitary group, PSU and Q, with an inner prime and of course Q a prime power. And I should note that currently, the only known example of a unitary group where the graph has diameter five is PSU 72. It's an open problem to classify all the unitary groups where the graph has diameter five. So this theorem gives a method of distinguishing the baby monster group from, and, and certain unitary groups from all other finite groups. So again, it's recognizability in some sense. Right, and for the next part of the talk, I'll be looking at how we can prove this theorem. And we'll see that the proof here is more direct than anything involving the prime graph. So first, a straightforward observation. We'll let m1 and m2 be maximal subgroups of G, and we'll assume that they have even order. This, of course, means that they contain involutions, a1 and a2 respectively. And because they're involutions, they generate a dihedral subgroup, D, which is proper in G because G is simple and therefore not dihedral. So uh, D is therefore a vertex of the intersection graph of G. Now, if we have two proper non-trivial subgroups, say S and J of M1 and M2 respectively, then we can join S and J by a path in the graph of length at most four. That's because, well, S and M1 intersect non-trivially because M1 contains all of S. M1 and D contain the involution A1. D and M2 contain A2. And M2 contains all of J. So the distance in the graph between S and J is at most four. In particular, we deduce that if every maximal subgroup of the group has even order, then the graph's diameter is at most four. So to determine exactly when the graph of a simple group might have diameter at least five, we only have to consider those non-abelian simple groups where there actually exists a maximal subgroup of odd order. So let's do that. Well, the first question we have to ask is which non-abelian simple groups have an odd order maximal subgroup? And the classification of these groups was almost completed in 1991 by Martin Liebeck and Jan Saxel. I'll explain what I mean by that shortly, but for now, the first family of groups to consider is the family of alternating groups of prime degree n. In this case, well, I should state, I should note that um, there are some restrictions on n for there to actually exist odd order maximal subgroups. But in any case, Chakan and Pollock proved that given a finite simple alternating group, the graph's diameter is at most four. And in fact, Shen gave an alternative proof of this fact. He proved that given any maximal subgroup m of the alternating group g, the order of m times the order of the maximal subgroup a n minus one is greater than the order of g. This implies immediately that m and a n minus one intersect non-trivially, and because every proper non-maximal subgroup lies in some maximal subgroup, we deduce that indeed the graph has diameter at most four. Okay, now there are some sporadic groups containing odd order maximal subgroups, and the smallest of these is the Matthew group M23. If we argue as Shen did in the alternative case, we can prove that in this case, the graph diameter is equal to four. Now the sporadic Thompson group contains odd order maximal subgroups, but every prime order subgroup lies in a maximal subgroup of even order. Now it's very easy to show that in general, the intersection graph diameter is the maximal distance between pairs of prime order subgroups. And so if we replace S and J from the previous slide by two prime order subgroups, we deduce that their distance in the graph is at most four, so the graph diameter is at most four. Okay, now from the theorem, we saw that the graph of the baby monster has diameter five. To prove that five is an upper bound for the graph diameter is quite easy. It's a bit harder to show that five is also a lower bound, but we can do so using a certain counting argument involving some of the maximal subgroups of G. Okay, and as I said before, Liebig and Saxel almost completed the classification of these groups containing odd order maximal subgroups. The only open case from their paper was the monster group, because in 1991, not enough was known about the monster's maximal subgroups. But now, thanks to more recent work of Holmes and Wilson, we know that the monster has no odd order maximal subgroup, and so again, the graph diameter is at most four. All right, there are two more families of groups to consider. First, the family of linear groups, PSL and Q, with n prime. Here we can show that the graph has diameter at most four using some very nice arguments suggested by Peter Cameron. And this is where the permutation groups actually come in. These arguments all involve the action of PSL and Q on the set of one-dimensional subspaces of the vector space at Q to the n. And finally, the family of unitary groups, PSU and Q with n and odd prime, we can show that the graph has diameter at most five using some arguments that are somewhat similar to those of the linear case. And these arguments are actually connected uh, with base size, which we heard about earlier today. And as I mentioned before, PSU 72 achieves this upper bound of five. So this uh, completes the proof, or at least the sketch of the proof, of the main theorem of this talk. 
And I'd like to conclude by uh, discussing some connections between delta G and some other graphs defined on the elements of a group. So as some general motivation and context, I will uh, briefly mention a certain hierarchy of graphs which Peter Cameron introduced earlier this year. And each graph in this hierarchy has vertex set the non-identity elements of a given group G. And for convenience, we'll assume here that G is non-abelian. Furthermore, on this slide, we use as an example the dihedral group of order 12 generated by an element A of order 6 and an involution B. So the first graph in this hierarchy is the complete graph on this set of vertices, that is the non-identity elements of G. And the next graph in the hierarchy is the subgraph of the complete graph, namely the non-generated graph denoted here by sigma of G. In this graph, two vertices are joined by an edge, if and only if they do not form a generating pair for G. So in this example, A cubed is a central element of G, so it cannot generate the non-abelian group G with any other element. Therefore, A cubed is joined to all other vertices in the graph. Okay, the next graph in the hierarchy is the commuting graph, where two vertices are joined by an edge, if and only if they commute. And because G is non-abelian, this is again a subgraph of the previous graph. And the hierarchy has additional graphs, but I will not define them here. So these graphs, except for the complete graph, I suppose are all very interesting. They have been studied and there is more to study about them. But it's also interesting to study the differences between subsequent graphs in the hierarchy. For example, the generating graph, which Scott will speak about later in the week, is the difference between the complete graph and the non-generating graph. And the next difference between the second and third graphs is the non-commuting non-generating graph, denoted by psi of g, which was one of the main topics of my PhD thesis. So for example, here is psi of g12. And this, uh, usually we would um, remove the central vertex a cubed from the vertex set, but in this talk, it doesn't matter. So now, uh, let's focus on the case where g is the baby monster. Now, the deception graph, delta g, and the non-generating graph, sigma of g, form something called a dual pair. This has a more general definition in a broader context, but what this means here is that any two adjacent subgroups in the deception graph contain a common element, a common uh, non-identity element uh, of g, in other words, a common vertex of the non-generating graph. And conversely, any two adjacent elements in the non-generating graph lie in a common proper non-trivial subgroup of G. In other words, a common vertex of the intersection graph. So there's this nice duality relationship between these two graphs. And why is that important? Well, Peter Karen proved that given two graphs that form a dual pair, one has diameter k, then the other will have diameter k minus one, k or k plus one. So since we know that the intersection graph of the baby monster has diameter five, we immediately deduce that the non-generating graph has diameter four, five, or six. In particular, four is the lower bound of the graph's diameter. And using so, by investigating in detail the maximum subgroups and elements of G, we can show that four is also half the bound of the graph's diameter, and so the diameter here is exactly equal to four. And using similar arguments, we can show that four is a lower bound and an upper bound for the diameter of the non-commuting, non-generating graph. Now, finally, I'd like to briefly introduce two more graphs. First, gamma G will note the subgraph of delta G induced by soluble subgroups of G. So gamma G is vertices, the proper non-trivial soluble subgroups of G, again with two vertices joined by an edge whenever they intersect non-trivially. And gamma G forms a dual pair with a soluble graph pi of G, which has vertex set the non-identity elements of G, and where two vertices are joined by an edge, if and only if they generate a soluble subgroup of G. Now, as I mentioned before, the downward of the intersection graph, which in this case is five, is the maximum distance between pairs of prime order subgroups. So there are some prime order subgroups, say S1 and S2, whose distance in delta G is equal to five. These prime order subgroups are of course soluble, the vertices in gamma G, so the distance in gamma G is at least five, therefore gamma G is diameter at least five, and so the diameter of the dual graph pi of G is at least four. This fact was observed in a recent paper on the archive written by Daniela Nemi, together with Tim Burness and Andrea Lucchini, and in fact they proved that in this case, pi of G has diameter either four or five. And I'll conclude by noting that this now feeds back into gamma G, which we deduce has diameter five or six. Thank you.